Hello, I'm Madison Lozano, your CAP trainer, and I'm excited to talk to you today about improving your CAP process. The goal of this presentation is to help you improve your internal processes, maximize efficiency, and run a smooth CAP program year round. I'm going to be sharing best practices regarding the application, staffing, accountability, communication with clients and how you can assess your own program and make changes to improve your CAP program in order to serve clients in a timely manner and fully expend your funds. One of the top complaints and the reason for calls to the department is that uh, people are complaining about how long subrecipients take to process applications or that they are unsure when they will get an answer on their application. So we went ahead and surveyed the top performing subrecipients in the network of all sizes, small, medium, and large, to determine the best practices to allow for timely processing and on-time expenditures of funds. The guidance shared here comes directly from the data from the subs within your network, and best practices are shared in order to help you make improvements to your program. Ultimately, our goal is that you fully expend your CAP funds within the terms of the contract, and these kinds of improvements can allow you to do so. So the first thing that you're going to want to look at is your CAP application. How many pages is your application, and how long does it take someone to complete one? And go ahead and complete one yourself to see. This graph here shows what the high-performing subrecipients, how many pages their applications are. And as you can see, the majority have a one to five page application. And under 10 pages is strongly recommended by the department. So take some time to look at your application and see which areas you might be request, requesting duplicate information, which sections can be combined, and any other ways that you can streamline it. Also keep in mind, you do not have to have your applicant sign in multiple places. One signature on the application will suffice. Another thing to consider is if you offer a shortened application for returning clients. So please keep in mind, you may roll over HSV forms from previous years, and only non-US citizens or US nationals that have to be rerun through SAVE need to be verified every year. Anyone who's already had US citizenship and identity verified does not need to reprovide those documents year after year. You may roll over that information. You can also have households sign an attestation verifying that their application information is the same. You want to always ensure that you do have updated contact information, address, and household makeup. If none of that has changed, they can attest to that um, or provide you updates. So you could use the option of a pre-populated app application, pulling that information that you already have to provide to returning applicants. And they could either attest that it is accurate or they could update it for you. Once you have all that updated, all they have to do is provide updated income documents from the past 30 days. So you can verify continued income eligibility and then process their applications. And often your client software will have the ability to roll over client data from year to year, so ensure you have that set up to avoid uh, manual data entry as much as possible. So once you've got your application streamlined, you really wanna look at the journey that that application and your applicants are taking step-by-step, step, breaking out every single step and which staff member is responsible for it. This is where you can identify duplicate steps, Identify what similar duties might be able to be combined. See where you have the same staff members doing things over and over again that don't necessarily need to do that. Uh, see what can be streamlined. You would really wanna minimize the number of hands on an application and avoid having an application go back and forth between staff. Every time another person's involved in the process, it just creates more complication and room for error. And when you're looking at your process, Really ensure that you're not adding in additional requirements that are not required by your contract or the TAC. Um, if it's not a requirement of the program, then why are we asking applicants to do it or to provide it? So just something to consider there. Now, starting at the very beginning of your application journey, 
look at which ways you're accepting applications. Is it primarily virtual in a portal or being via email? Or are you accepting a lot of paper applications? It's really a good practice to track how your applications come in, and that allows you to encourage applicants to use the most efficient process. In our opinion, email should be your default. That is the quickest and easiest form of communication with clients, and it has the added benefit of having uh, documentation in writing. It's important to look at how you are notifying, or excuse me, if you are um, requiring in-person appointments, why are they being required and what benefit does that bring? If these can be eliminated, except in very specific circumstances that would be encouraged, uh, in-person appointments definitely should not be the default uh, when we have the ability to do so much virtually at this point in time. Next, you wanna look at how are you notifying clients of missing documents? This, um, from what we've understood, is the number one holdup in processing an application is missing documentation. So the sooner you are able to notify the client that they're missing something and they can provide it to you, the quicker you're gonna be able to move that application along in the process. If we let you know weeks in between or we're mail mailing out paper letters regarding documentation, um, that's just too much time between when they've actually submitted the application and the likelihood that they're gonna follow up is less. So ensure that you are identifying missing documentations as quickly as you can when an application comes in. You also wanna make sure that you have a way to immediately identify a disconnect, that you can meet the TAC requirements regarding the time constraints. Again, high-performing subs are using phone and email to communicate with clients. Paper mail really should be a last resort. Uh, text is also a good option. A lot of clients respond well to that. And whatever way that works best for your clients, we of course encourage you to do, but typically uh, some sort of virtual communication is gonna be encouraged. Same with how you notify clients of approval or denial of their cases. Uh, best practices say to avoid having more than one to three staff persons touching an application. And when serving our subrecipients that were high performing, uh, the vast majority said that an application can and should be processed in less than an hour. And that would be a completed application, of course. Regarding communication with your clients, your website and your social media pages are your best resource for communicating with your clients aside from when you actually speak to them in person or one-on-one. -on -one. So you wanna be sure that it is clear how to apply and what benefits are provided by CAP. We really encourage you to educate your clients on your CAP process and the expected timeline. That is probably the main reason that we get calls from clients is that they've applied with a subrecipient, they have no time frame for when they'll get an answer on their application, and they can't get in touch with anyone to get a status update. It creates a lot of frustration and fear for the client, and then it has to get the, the department involved and we have to reach out to you and it just gets a lot more people involved in something that shouldn't be so complicated. So please, when you are working with a client, when you are communicating on your social media about your CAP program, let people know what to expect when they apply, what the typical turnaround time is, and how or when they will get status updates. This would significantly cut down on client complaints, and we just really want you to be upfront about this information. Even if the information and the expected timeline is longer than you might want it to be, you know, maybe it's gonna be four months until they hear back on their application. One, that's something that the client needs to know. They may you know, be waiting for something that's not gonna be coming, and they need to find other resources to pay their bill before they are without. Um, so it's just fair to the client, and it's also just going to help streamline this whole process for the department and for you as an agency. So just own the timeline that you have, be clear and upfront with your clients, and then work internally to beat that timeline if you're not happy with it. And finally, with complaints, you wanna ensure that your applicants know the process. The majority of the complaints, I believe, could be resolved at the subrecipient level, and that's the way that it should be handled. Um, but of course, if things need to be escalated to the department, you can do so. 
but per the TAC, you need to have a complaint process internally in writing. So from what we understand, the, one of the biggest burdens for agencies with this program is that they have a large backlog that develops at the beginning of the year. I hear this every year, and what I would say is to have a plan in place to address that backlog. If we know there's going to be a rush, um, just thinking through it the last couple months of this year will help you better handle it when the time comes. What we heard from the high-performing subs is that that beginning of the year backlog takes one to two months to work through. So I would say set a goal for your agency to get through that backlog in two months or less, meaning by the beginning of March, you're on track processing applications as they come in and that you've already moved past those January and February applications in the first two months. And again, you want to consider the use of a streamlined app, uh, you know, shortened applications for the returning clients that will cut down on your staff time. You also may want to consider hiring temporary staff at the beginning of the year if you know this is a repeat issue that you're dealing with year after year. So when you're looking at your process mapping, discuss a plan for this at that time. The high-performing subrecipients, when we ask them how long it typically takes them to process applications year-round, not talking about that beginning of year backlog point, uh, they said on average it was four to six weeks. And so what we would recommend is that you set a goal to process an application after it comes in in four weeks or less. Um, we have the data from these high-performing subrecipients to show that these, this is not only possible, but it is, it is a best practice. And the longer that we have applications piling up, the more likely that you're going to hear from those people, we're going to hear from them, and it's going to create a lot more work on everybody's end. Now, what I'd like you to think about is if you have the right amount of staff for the job of CAP. Now that the COVID years are waning, we are looking at more years with regular CAP allocations. Um, it's not going to be as much funding as we had in the past. So it's a really good time to look at the number of staff you have working on the program full and part-time and determining if you have the right amount of people. Smaller agencies that we surveyed have one to five staff working full-time on CAP, whereas medium and large agencies have 10 plus staff working solely on CAP. We recommend that you assess the amount of staff you have annually and throughout the year to see if and when temporary staff may be needed and just keep in mind that on an average year, you may not need the same number of staff as you did in the COVID years where you had multiple CAP contracts running simultaneously. Next, you really wanna look at if your staff are happy with their work. The number one way you can do that is to look at your turnover rate. Every high-performing sub that we surveyed had less than 15% annual staff turnover rate. If you're not sure how your staff feel, you can also survey them on their satisfaction. If you find that staff are not really happy in their roles, that's when we can look at incentives and other ways of improving morale, which we'll talk about more in a few minutes. I also really want to look at if your staff have the appropriate skills and training for their roles. If they don't, identify training needs and see what kind of help you can get. The department is always available to train staff on CAP, um, and you can always access other trainings as well. Perhaps you, want, you need to realign your staff, that you have some staff that are just not in the right position for their skills, but they bring a lot to the table and they could fit in somewhere else. So looking at your staffing, um, determining you know, who, who best excels in which areas and how they can best contribute um, is an important, some important task to do throughout the year and on an annual basis. And also just ensure that your more tenured staff who have more experience in this program are taking some of the tasks that might have uh, more room for error, such as calculating income or making pledges. You also want to really look at if your staff are paid well for their work and they feel that they are receiving, or that they are valued in what they do. And just keep in mind that you know, high-performing high subs report that their newer and less experienced staff are the ones who are maybe opening and reviewing applications initially, obtaining consumption histories, taking phone calls, and, you know, alerting people to missing documents. And then 
you had the more tenured staff doing these more precise calculations. Another big thing that the high performing subs uh, shared with us about how they work with their staff is that they have a strong record of accountability. So what you need to do is to determine how long it takes to typically process one of your applications. If it's too long, again, that's where you wanna look at a streamlined application, but your goal should be to have it take less than an hour to review and process a typical application. So you wanna track and monitor how many applications staff process daily and weekly. With the high-performing subrecipients, it was very common for a person to process 15 to 20 applications a week. So that is a good goal to set for your staff. All of the high-performing subs use metrics with their staff. Newer staff may have different metrics than more tenured staff. The metrics can definitely vary by job function. And it's important to track error rates so you can determine where your staff have training needs. If someone is continually making errors with income calculations, then that's an area that they either need training in or perhaps they're not the right person for that particular role. So it's really, really important to track how your staff perform, monitor their performance. Metrics and data are key in allowing you to do this. And then you can kind of reassess your goals and expectations for your staff throughout the year. And data allows you to make those decisions from an informed place. Some of the metrics that we heard from the high-performing subs were, you know, staff had to either process three or five applications a day. And next, I want to talk about incentives, which we can use to improve staff morale. It's really important that your staff are happy with what they're doing because they're going to do a good job for you, they're going to do a good job for their clients, and they're going to want to keep working for you. So ensuring staff morale is a really important part of your job. When it, again, ensure staff are paid appropriately for their work. Some examples of incentives that we heard from the high-performing subs were merit increases and bonuses for staff performance, gift cards for staff performance, um, awarding paid time off when you're able, and also allowing for in-office celebrations when you hit certain goals or metrics. And they talked about uh, rewarding staff and incentivizing them during the busy time with some of these things and rewarding staff for their production, their work ethic, their attendance, and for their retention. Uh, one agency mentioned a 12-month retention bonus that's paid for someone that stays on for the full year. And finally, I want to emphasize that you should ensure you're not adding complication to the CAP process. Again, if it's not a rule that's required, think about why you're asking it to, to be a rule. Does it actually need to be something that a client needs to provide, or is it just extra effort on both your parts? We encourage you to be creative in how you problem solve. Develop your own internal tools and forms as needed to minimize efforts. We have seen agencies get creative with, uh, you know, the, do the department may provide a document and they'll say, hey, can we can we streamline it this way or can we modify it this way to fit into our application? And we're always happy to look at those kind of things with you. Automate as much as possible. That reduces human error. So make your client software work for you. Work with your software provider on that. Um, and anything that you can be automating and rolling over from previous years will reduce the amount of time you're doing data entry and reduce the possibility of errors and utilize any options that you have to save time and effort for your staff. As an example of that, making lump sum payments, we've heard was a big way that it cut down on staff time versus making monthly pledges. So if you're choosing not to utilize that option, just think through why and if it's the best choice for your agency. And where to begin. Again, we talked about start with process mapping. You really have to clarify what your current process is. Even if as you're writing it out, you're like, why are we doing this? This doesn't make sense. Write it down every single step of the way, who's responsible for it, how much time it takes, and then see what you have there and if it makes sense to you and if every single step is necessary from beginning to end. You wanna find sticking points, see what you can streamline, see where you can reduce unnecessary duplications, in staff efforts, ensure your database has automation built into the system, 
ensure you have the right staff in the right roles and have data that you can track to see your progress. So we talk about setting SMART internal goals. SMART goals are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. So if you know that your CAP process has room for improvements, look at what kind of internal goals you can set and then use data to track that to see how you do. Another, another big thing that we suggest is utilizing the CAP network. So you have TACA, you have us with the ability to connect you to other subrecipients for peer support. If there's an area that you know there's room for improvement, you are always welcome to reach out to me and I can connect you with another agency that might already be doing that well, or another agency that's also struggling with the same thing and needs to talk through processes. So please lean on your peers um, because they're doing the same job as you and they understand it better than anyone else. And finally, I you know, mentioned reaching out to TDHCA really as a last resort. Once you've already utilized all of the resources that have been provided, um, we can always do a one-on-one -on -one session to troubleshoot things and brainstorm solutions. Um, we just really want you to kind of be thinking through these things first before engaging with the department. If you ever have uh, documents or any kind of materials you want us to review and provide feedback on, we can do that as well. So I hope today was helpful in thinking through ways you can improve your CAP process. And if there's anything that we can do to help, please reach out. Thank you very much for listening.